background a little bit. Uh, Betsy, I really appreciate you sharing your time with us this morning and welcome to the online CAT conference. Thank you so much, Stacey and Kristen. It's so great to be here with you guys. It's so, it's just, I'm honored and thrilled and I'm a passionate cat person. So I'm thrilled to be among my people. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I will go ahead and get started unless, you know, Stacy or Kristen, there's anything else you need me to do prior. Hopefully it's, it looks like everyone can see my screen and hopefully you can hear me okay. If there are any issues with that, please interrupt me and let me know. But um, so just to give you a little bit of information about myself, I am, like I said, among my people here and these are my own critters. Of course, I have to share them with all of you. <laughs> We have four cats in our house and our big uh, pity dog, Berkeley, um, and he is completely ruled by these cats, which is hilarious. He's he's a big boy and they tell him what to do every moment of the day. And uh, like you, um, I am also a TNR advocate. I have my own feral cat colony. We moved into our house uh, in 2005. And when I moved in here, we live a little bit rural. I'm, I'm phoning it in here from Maryland. And when we moved onto our property, there were actually a lot of cats, um, 22 to be exact, <laughs> which was not expected, but certainly has been a joy for me. I have done, I've TNR'd all of them over the years, taking care of any new arrivals. And I can tell you firsthand that TNR really does work. We're down to four now. The four on the screen here are my, my outdoor loves and I care for them every day. So it's so wonderful to, to provide some information today to help you guys um, get the help you need to help more cats. So I love it. And just a quick note on where I came from. I actually started uh, back in the early 90s in Texas. I fell into this work, as so many of us do, um, as a volunteer at the Brazos Animal Shelter, which actually doesn't even exist anymore. They're um, now the Aggie Land Humane Society out in um, College Station, Texas. And, you know, just I, I started volunteering there and discovered just how challenging these issues are and how much need there was. So I decided to make this a career and went on to the Humane Society of the United States, where I had the good fortune of doing quite a lot of work in managing volunteers. I learned a tremendous amount, did some research with the University of North Carolina at Charlotte on the impact of volunteers on staff and had the good fortune to create the National Volunteer Center for the Humane Society of the United States. Um, and in my consulting work now with ADISA, which I can tell you about in just a second, um, I also do work with a company called Energize, which is specifically devoted to helping organizations like yours and others, not just animal organizations, but all causes, to engage volunteers strategically and effectively. So I've really made this my heart work, and um, I'm feeling incredibly grateful that I get to do this work and be here with all of you. Um, and so Adisa, our company that I formed with, uh, with Laura Maloney from the animal field as well, um, we are a group of passionate animal people, but we don't work only with animal causes. We also work with other social cause um, organizations around everything from strategic leadership to strategic planning to community engagement and all kinds of issues. We basically are helping organizations, you know, achieve their greatest good. So. Um, today, just to kind of begin to move into what we're going to cover, we have a lot of ground to cover in this short hour, 15 minutes. So I, I as you can probably tell, I'm a fairly t fast talker. Um, if I'm going too fast, feel free to chime in in the questions box and I can slow down a little bit, but I wanna make sure I give you as many tools as possible. So we're gonna briefly talk a little bit about understanding volunteers and what they need. We're gonna talk about how to assess and prepare for engaging volunteers, which I'm sure most, if not all of you, are already working with other volunteers, and I'm sure the majority of you are probably volunteers yourselves. But in doing this work, you know, engaging more people in this cause is critically important to achieving our goals. So I wanna help you to expand and, and multiply yourselves so we can go out there and be armies of good. So we're gonna talk about volunteer roles, strategic recruitment, how to train, providing support for leaders in the volunteer space and how to you know, how to address issues and provide feedback when things are, are going awry a little bit. So as you can see, and that was my dog Berkeley, you probably heard, <laughs> uh, he's chiming in today with his support. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in to 
talking a little bit about understanding what volunteers actually need. Um, and I love this comic. It's one of those old Gary Larson far side comics. In case you can't read it, it says, oh, what a cute little Siamese. Is he friendly? As you can see, the owners are looking a little ragged there. It's pretty funny. So what do you need from the volunteers you're working with? And I would love to hear from you if we're able. And uh, Stacy and Kristen, please let me know if this is not possible. But I think if you guys put your thoughts in quickly into the um, question box, we can get a sense of what you're thinking in terms of when you're when you are yourself are leading volunteers, what do you need from them? Take just a second to write a couple of the of your thoughts. I'd love to hear from you. Yep, so I'll keep an eye on the box here and oh, I'm looking okay. here. Uh, reliability, I see a lot. There we go. Motivation to help in undesired positions. Mm, yes. Consistency, commitment, a uh, lot of reliables, extra hands to do the work of caring for the pets on a daily basis. Yep. Flexibility, uh, Great. fosters, follow through on commitments. Yeah. Dependability, represent organization well, take Those charge. Are great. Ownership, yeah. dedication, consistency, uh, following protocols, makes my job easier, not harder. <laughs> That's a great one. Yes. Of Doesn't course. hate <laughs> other people. <laughs> I love it. Ownership, engagement in the organization mission, sharing our goals with others, bring themselves to the table, need to be comfortable telling me if they understand what they've been taught. Is my messaging getting across? Nice working well with others. Oh, those are really good. And they're all critically important. Um, right. And I'm hearing a lot of, I mean, as Stacey, you pointed out, a lot of the reliability, you need to be able to count on your volunteers. You want them to follow the rules. So, you know, volunteers themselves also have needs. They have needs and expectations of the people who are leading them and the organizations that they're devoting their time to. So now using the same approach, I would like to hear what you feel volunteers need from you. What do you think volunteers are looking for when they come and volunteer their time with you? Hey, keeping a look on that. Oh, here we go. Uh, we get education, communication. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Need to feel appreciated. Yeah. Yep. So you're seeing the questions too. Here. I am yep. now. Yes, yep. I figured it out. Thank you. Direction, <laughs> information. Yep. Common goals, feeling they're making a difference. Lots of dedication, recognition, appreciation. And that makes sense, right? Because they're they're giving their time to you mm -hmm. and to the cause that they care about. They want to feel like they're making a difference. They want to be appreciated in the in what they do. And I'm seeing also that folks are saying they need training and support, right? Which is excellent. You guys are right on it. And so thank you for participating in this. We'll do this a little more throughout because I'd love to hear from you. It's hard to do this as a one-way one -way, um, experience. So when it comes to being successful in engaging volunteers, it's really about this sweet spot between your needs as an organization and the needs of the volunteers who are giving their time to you, right? I mean, you want to be able to count on the people who are doing the time to take on some of these challenging roles. You want them to be reliable and follow the rules and show up when you need them. And at the same time, volunteers are looking to feel appreciated, want to do some meaningful work, uh, and want to make an impact. And so how do we, in, in doing this work, find that sweet spot and ensure that we are meeting both sides of the equation because that's where we feel there that's where you see the effectiveness and when we don't meet both of the needs this is what we tend to have this is what tends to happen so tell me if this sounds familiar to you or think about your own experiences when both of those needs are not met we tend to end up in this kind of cycle of uh, a revolving door in which we recruit volunteers who may not be right for the work because we haven't taken the time to get to know their needs and understand what they want to do. Perhaps because we're so busy, we're not providing training and guidance and support, which as you guys just indicated, volunteers want and need. So as a result, we end up spending a lot of time handholding, putting out fires, dealing with all the questions that come up every day, 
And then the staff, if, if we have staff or other volunteers are getting frustrated and perhaps distrust the volunteer program or feel volunteers aren't worth the effort. And then the good people who are trying to donate their time and be of help get frustrated and leave. And we start right back over again. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> so my goal today is to help us prevent this feeling of being on the hamster wheel. Like I wanna help you get out in front of this and create some infrastructure to really provide what volunteers need and to get what the organization needs. And as the saying goes, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so getting ahead of this is important and it does require planning and preparation in order to be successful with volunteer engagement. And I know, I imagine on a daily basis, this is you, right? <laughs> As this is all of us. I mean, it's so hard. And that's, I think, one of the biggest challenges in this work is to, to carve time out, to be proactive, to put infrastructure in place. It can feel really daunting when we're surrounded by really important life-saving work on a daily basis. But it really takes, um, it really, the investment is worth the effort because in the long run, if you can take a little time to put these pieces in place, your life will become so much easier. And so rather than feeling overwhelmed and that we can't, I want to encourage us all to think about this as some baby steps and some practical tools about how we can involve more humans in our work to help kitties. And a lot of us in this field may feel like we like animals better than we like people, right? Um, I think many people who do this work feel that way. I'm actually probably a little unique in the sense I really love people and I really believe that if these issues that we're trying to solve were created by people, then our people are also the solution to these problems. And that means engaging the community in our work. And so I really think that by helping others help us, we will achieve so much more than if we play a role of a martyr and try to take it all on and ourselves and work ourselves into the ground. Because frankly, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and the cats need us for the long haul. So just as, before I get into some practical tips and tools, I just wanna take a moment to, to talk about that and to encourage all of you you know, to, to put your own mask on first, right? Like when you're on an airplane, what is it that the flight attendant says? They say, put your own mask on before helping others. And by that, I, I encourage each of you to, to do that for yourselves. Engage volunteers in helping you directly first. Like what is it that is taxing you in the roles that you play and how can you help share your workload with others? Um, because you need to provide yourself with some breathing room to be able to think these issues through, put these tools in place I'm going to share with you today. It is going to take some effort. Allow yourself some downtime. I hope you all take time off. <laughs> and again, remembering this is a marathon, not a sprint. And I need you all in this for the long haul. So jumping right in, how do we think about uh, number two here, assessing and preparing for volunteers? And I say this knowing most of you, if not all of you, are already working with volunteers. So I'm asking you to kind of back up the train just a little bit and think about uh, what, what's going on with your volunteer engagement, what's working and what's not. So just take a second as I, I read through these questions to think about how it's going right now. Are you losing volunteers? Is it that cycle of volunteers coming through the result revolving door and leaving after a short period of time? Or are they staying for a good while? Are you seeing volunteers burning out? And, and what is that looking like? Are, they, are, they, are you finding them calling in sick for shifts, things like that? Do you know why your volunteers are leaving? Is it because you know, the, the work that they're doing isn't what they expected to do, or it somehow didn't match their needs or expectations? Um, you know, is there patterns to who's leaving? Are there things that are causing burnout among your volunteers? You know, where might you need more help from people in the community in the work that you do? And what's the kind of help that you need? What specifically are you needing help with? Thinking about those things is really important in terms of designing future volunteer engagement for your cause. And so just as an example, let's say you're noticing volunteers are coming on board, you're getting them engaged, say with trap, neuter, return program, or you know, doing foster care. And you find out after a few months, the volunteers are, are pretty consistently dropping out of the program. What is that actually telling you? And I would say probably, of course, it could be a lot of different things, but the reality of what they were expecting 
isn't what they were experiencing once they began their work. And so, you know, being able to pay attention to these kinds of things and noticing when there are shifts in your volunteer engagement can give you a ton of information to help you fix it rather quickly. And especially with new volunteers, it's super important to be checking in with them pretty often in the beginning to make sure that it is that, that what you've engaged them in doing is aligning with what their expectations were and the wants and needs they had when they came on board. And as part of this assessing how things are going, I would encourage you to be putting yourself in the shoes of volunteers. Obviously, when volunteers come on board, they're pretty excited. They want to be helpful. Maybe they're a little nervous about what this work is going to be like. You know, what does it take? What do they, what, how long do they have to wait before they're actually contacted and onboarded into your program? You know, how long does it take them to get the training and for them to actually hit the ground running? So thinking about it from the volunteer point of view can be super helpful in seeing how things are going. And of course, I would highly encourage you to actually ask your volunteers how it's going for them. It never hurts and you will get a lot of good information. And also, I think this is something critically important, especially in animal welfare, is what are we actually inviting volunteers into in our organizations? I mean, are, if you're looking like, the organiz looking like the group of people on the left, you know, is there a lot of infighting? Are, you know, is there a lot of drama happening? Is, you know, is, are people not very friendly, frankly, when volunteers are coming on board? And if so, if your culture is that, what can you expect from volunteers? Most are not going to want to stay, right? I mean, people want to be positive and make an Im impact. And if they're finding that they're having a negative experience and the culture of the organization isn't positive and there's some weird underlying things happening, people are, are not going to stick around. And so in a way, you really have to clean up your own house before they, inviting your guests in, in terms of uh, you know, recognizing that what's happening inside your organization will dramatically affect volunteers' ability to make a difference. And, and this image here, I love this graphic. Um, so many of you probably remember Pac-Man as I do growing up, but that th what this is representing is that you can have the best strategy and goals and, and tactics to reach your goal in terms of helping cats. You know, you can have the best TNR program doing all the amazing things, but if the culture of your organization is toxic or negative or problematic in any way, it will eat your strategy for lunch in terms of it will be really hard for you to achieve your goal if your organization is dysfunctional. So it's really important because when you're inviting volunteers into that, they will take that on or they will leave. And so also thinking about when you're preparing to engage volunteers, who's in charge of the volunteers? And I imagine, given that most of you are out there doing such important TNR work as volunteers yourselves, you are donating your time as well in leading volunteers, which I know is extra challenging. And, and in my early years of this work, I did that as well. I was actually working full time at Texas A&M University, and I was full-time running the volunteer program at the shelter I was with. So I can relate to the challenge of juggling those roles. But having someone as that critical point is really important. And it doesn't mean that you have to do it alone. It's really critical to have others supporting you in that work. And we're going to get to that later in the hour. But who is responsible for overseeing the volunteer program? And is that person a people person? I would argue that that's really important, that you have to actually enjoy working with people to be a good coordinator of other volunteers. And does the volunteer coordinator have the skills and the tools needed to be successful, which you're going to find out through this hour what those are. And I would encourage you to you know, take that to heart and take some notes as we go so that you can implement some of the things I'm going to get to. And if you're an organization that does have staff, paid staff, have expectations been set for staff? I'm a big believer in having the saying or, the, or phrasing in every staff member's job description um, that working with volunteers is actually included in those job descriptions, that there is an expectation that every staff member will be engaging with volunteers and supporting volunteers in their work um, because it really is a full organization responsibility to be successful with volunteers. And are expectations for working with volunteers covered in new staff orientations? Like, do they know when they're coming on board for their job that this is part of their role and that they're going to actually be evaluated in their performance reviews if it's an organization that does that 
on their work with volunteers. That should be a question as part of their review when they sit down with their supervisor is how is that going? How do volunteers uh, feel about their work with this particular staff member? So let's move now into this section three, which is around developing clear volunteer roles. And I think this is critically important. And a lot of organizations and folks who work with volunteers tend to start with this question, which is what can we give volunteers to do? Like, how are we going to keep volunteers busy? Uh, what, what can we hand them to do so that basically they stay out of our way and we get some work done? And I would strongly suggest that is not the right question to ask, that what tends to come up when we ask it in that way is busy work. And while there's nothing wrong with having volunteers assist with some busy work, you are missing out on what makes volunteers so magical and special. And so here's how I would encourage you to go about evaluating and creating volunteer roles. First, just make a list of everything that you and others are doing in your organization. Cross out things that you feel you should do yourself or that are particular to certain people that you know just aren't appropriate to hand over to volunteers or maybe that you really want to retain for yourself because obviously we all have things we really enjoy doing. And then circle those or put a box or take a highlighter and highlight the ones that you could actually give to somebody else to do. And that's, a, that's it, it's as simple as that, but it's a very different way about going about creating a volunteer role. That basically, rather than trying to think of what do we need to give volunteers to do, we're instead asking the question, what needs to be done? What are the things that have to happen in order us, for us to meet our mission? And how can we give those things to volunteers to help us achieve them? And so focusing with volunteers on what is mission critical, uh, even thinking about what are we doing now that we would really like to do more of and we just don't have the time or the resources to do it. Those things could be perfect roles for volunteers. And what are the biggest unmet needs of cats and our communities? Where are there gaps in the services that we would like to provide? Can we build a volunteer role to develop those needs or develop the services to meet those needs? And another good question is, what might we do differently if we had more skills or time available? And those are great opportunities to engage volunteers. So it's just a different mindset around what we're asking people to do. And I love this sign. I actually took this picture at an animal shelter. I'm trying to remember where it was. I can't recall where it was, but it was on the play yard uh, fence. And it says, before you complain, have you volunteered yet? Right? I love that. I thought that was such a great sign. Um, and I would encourage you as when you're thinking about volunteer roles and how to perhaps expand what volunteers can do for you is to think about um, and ask current staff or other volunteers, what would they be willing to share with somebody who's a qualified volunteer? And I have the word qualified in there because I think it's important because there are, um, you know, there are concerns from people about engaging volunteers and thinking, you know, there's stereotypes, I guess is what I'm trying to say, that when you think of a volunteer, some folks think of them as unskilled labor. And really, if we're doing this right, they're not. We're, we'll be recruiting the right people for the right roles, which we're going to get into. But querying your staff and volunteers around what projects they would like to see done that they don't have time or the skills to do can be great ways to uh, figure out some new ways to involve volunteers and also asking them if they're willing to support and guide a volunteer to do those things. Really important because you're going to need their help to make this happen. And the more involvement everyone in the organization has with determining what volunteers will do and how they will do it, the more accepting and happy they will be with the volunteers. So obviously there is a ton of things volunteers do in cat related programs. <laughs> Everything from transporting and trapping to foster parents to colony caretakers to running clinics and, and managing, uh, you know, preparing cats for spay neuter. I mean, there's so many different activities volunteers can do. I would encourage you that, you know, as you're thinking this through, do a quick check to make sure what you're considering asking volunteers to do are appropriate things for them. Are these things that volunteers would be interested in doing? Uh, if you had time, would you be willing to do it yourself? And is it a valuable enough activity that's worthy of someone to donate their time to get it done? And can those, whatever you're asking a volunteer to do, to do can it be accomplished within the time frame that a volunteer can reasonably invest? Because the reality is, 
you know, volunteers are only often donating a few hours at a time. It's not like you're going to have full-time staff available to you through volunteerism. So it needs to be chunkable, I guess, for lack of a better phrase. And I love the concept of sharing dirty work with the necessary because, you know, this picture on the left, someone playing with a cat, right? That's what a lot of folks expect when they volunteer with animal causes, right? Everyone wants to play with animals all day long. But we actually have some really important critically critical work to get done, whether it's cleaning cages or hosing out cat traps. It's not always the, the glamorous, fun, warm and fuzzy work. We need to get some real practical things done. So I would encourage that as you're coming up with your roles for volunteers to pair up the dirty work with the necessary. So for example, that, that setting that expectation that if someone's assisting for with a trap day, that at the end of that day, part of their role is to help make sure that the traps are returned clean and ready for use the next time. And that's not that's not an unacceptable thing to ask, that they're going to be out having, having fun, working with cats at the end of the day, they also have to clean. <laughs> that could be a great way to share it. Uh, I would also encourage you to put all of this in writing. And I know that sounds like a lot, but it really would help. First, it helps to give volunteers a clear idea of what you're actually asking them to do and making it very overt what all is involved, what skills are necessary to do the role you're asking them to do, and what those expectations are. What's the training and level of experience you need them to have? What training are you going to provide them to prepare them for that role? Who are they going to report to? All of those things. And I do have a, I have a great handout on this that I created um, and I'm happy to provide it. Um, so Stacy and Kristen, I'll, I'll shoot that over to you uh, after this because um, it's a great tool to help you guys to, to, if you don't currently have your volunteer roles in writing, I would encourage you to ask your volunteers to help you do that. They know best what they're doing right now. Go ahead and have them put their roles down on paper because in addition to what I said earlier about it being important in terms of having volunteers understand what their expectations are, it's a wonderful tool for you if a volunteer is not doing what's needed or maybe they're you know not performing their job very well or they're stepping outside of bounds, whatever it may be, it gives you an objective tool to take and address those issues with a volunteer with, so that you know you have something clear, you've laid it out and it, it provides really a nice objective way to address any issues that arise. And just a final thought on when you're thinking about creating these roles, that titles really do matter. Uh, volunteers, you know, they want to feel appreciated. They want to feel important, frankly. So, you know, what, what can we do to make that role sound really fun and engaging while being an important part of the mission of the organization? Um, and actually, I'm going to skip this uh, sharing, although you, I would love you to go ahead and share in the chat box uh, some of your creative titles and um, hopefully others can see that because it might give you some creative ideas as you go. So like, uh, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading them out loud. So take a look at the question box and if you have for your volunteers created some cool titles, share them so others can steal them from you, would you please? <laughs> but as an example, you know, when I think of somebody uh, who is out there, a volunteer who is out in the community doing community events. Perhaps they are uh, staffing a table at a fair, sharing information about the organization. What what could we do as a way of a title for them that would make them feel meaningful? You know, I've seen people call them, for example, a community outreach assistant or an exhibit manager or whatever. But I would encourage you to get more creative. What if we call them a mission ambassador? or something like that, where that has a very different feel and a meaning to it, doesn't it? It sends a different message, it gives the volunteer pride and makes them feel critically important. And I do see somebody posted something, I love it. There's um, Glam Squad, that's fabulous, and Sanitation Specialist, I love it, you guys. I knew you, would, I knew you wouldn't disappoint. All right, so moving into recruitment. Uh, and I think it's really important to recruit specifically for the roles that you're needing to fill. Don't skip this step. It's something that I see so many organizations do. And, and here's some of the information around why this is important. So first, when you're thinking about recruiting new volunteers, I would encourage you to, again, to audit yourself. What's happening? When a volunteer comes to your website, your Facebook page, whatever your online social media looks like, are they able to find an overview of who you are and what you do? 
can they see uh, some information about the impact that you have so they get excited about potentially contributing to your organization? And is there a list of clear volunteer opportunities and needs? It's amazing to me how many sites I go to uh, in this field where it's really, they may say, oh, we need volunteers, but it's not clear what you're actually looking for. You need to spell it out so that you're attracting people who will actually help you achieve what you're looking to do. And is it easy to apply? You know, nothing worse than throwing out that, that you need volunteers and then not having an easy way for them to get engaged. So take a moment and audit yourself on your social media and your website and be super specific about what you need. I know this is a dog example, but, um, but I share this one because I haven't yet found a great cat example. So this is my challenge to all of you. I loved this. This is uh, part of, uh, I, I believe this was from Connecticut Humane Society, one of their shelters in Connecticut. They have a number of shelters. And I loved this on their website for a number of reasons. They're recruiting dog walkers. And you can see in their description, they talk about, hey, do you love dogs? This is what we need. We need volunteers to be able to handle dogs that are large, up to 120 pounds. Dogs might be pulling or jumping. So you're, you're painting a really clear picture here that it's not just coming and walking tiny little foo-foo dogs, but you're gonna to have to be able to handle some challenging dogs, but it's a rewarding thing to do, that we're going to provide you with safety training so that you don't get injured or hurt the dog while you're doing this. And they're clear about their requirements. They're saying we need folks who can you know, get out there, be in good physical condition, who can follow instructions and work with the public. They're specifically asking for the commitment of two hours per week for six months. And even better, they have the open shifts posted online. And I really liked that. And they're keeping it updated, which is also really important because it doesn't help anyone if I see this posting for Dog Walker and I apply, but I'm only available on Saturday and Sundays. So you see here, they're saying we actually need people during the week. We need people Monday, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so that tells me right away as a volunteer, hmm, maybe I need to look at something else because I'm, you know, the time I can commit is not actually when they need me. So I would be specific in your recruitment request. And also, you know, what I've shared so far is really you pushing out to the community from your networks, but a lot of people may not be looking for you. How can we find the people that uh, might be good for our organizations who otherwise might not think to contact a cat rescue or an animal shelter or a TNR program? So as you're looking at the roles that you have to fill, um, just as a simple example, say you are doing those community outreach events and you need volunteers to, to table and fundraise. What about finding people who are really good at public speaking? Rather than waiting for someone to come to you, can you seek out teachers, you know, people who are in the community doing this work for, for paid organizations and ask them, hey, you have a skill set we need. Would you be interested in volunteering with us? The number one reason people volunteer is because they were specifically and personally asked. And so it's really important that we don't just throw this out to the universe and hope people come to us, but we seek out the people we need to do the work. And don't hesitate to be creative. I mean, I just shared this because I love this ad. I, I have no idea if it actually was effective. I hope it was because I think it's so fun. But the Animal Foundation in Vegas did this ad recruiting get, uh, foster foster families. And it says, tell your mother-in-law the guest room is taken. Kitten season is coming. Foster a, a pet, save a life, and your sanity. <laughs> it just cracked me up. So, you know, have a little fun with it. Get Let people see that this work can be enjoyable and that they can make a difference. And a couple of quick things on uh, recruitment uh, broadly are thinking about ways to engage people in different ways. For example, here you'll see what are the opportunities for kids and families? Um, one of the strongest predictors of volunteering in adulthood is having volunteered as a kid with your family. So are there opportunities for kids to be involved? And I know that can be super tricky because so much of the work we do um, is tough for kids, but there's a lot of different creative ways without them perhaps doing hands-on trap new to return that kids can make a difference. Uh, Houston SPCA, for example, you see here in the, in the image, they have children taking those toilet paper tubes, paper towel tubes, and making enrichment toys by stuffing them with cat kibble so that while the cats are you know, in a trap or in the shelter or what have you, they have something to keep their minds busy and do enrichment. Um, scout clubs can do food drives. 
Uh, and you see here in this picture, scouts creating feral cat shelters. So there's a lot of ways you can involve families in communities that doesn't involve hands-on work with animals, but can still provide support for what you're trying to do. Great volunteer opportunities. And also test drive volunteering. And that is where volunteers just come in and help you for a day. It's a low commitment activity. It doesn't require being assigned to a big involved position. It's just an opportunity for them to test your organization because most volunteers want to feel you out before they're willing to sign on, say for a six month commitment to coming in every week. They wanna see what you're all about. So can you have volunteers come in for a day just to stack food bags and sort donations, things like that. So that is a great way to help engage people, give them a flavor for what the organization does, and then offers you an opportunity to convert them into longer term volunteers. And so a few ideas to convert them is making sure that you're intentional about that volunteer day. So you don't want them to just come in, stack bags of cat food and leave. You wanna provide a warm welcome, introduce them to the organization, give them a flyer to take home with them. At the end, before they leave for the day, Get them together in a group, debrief, thank them, ask them if they'd like to be on your email list so that you can communicate with them. Don't miss these opportunities for converting quick volunteer people into longer term supporters of your organization. And what are the also remote opportunities? Maybe not everyone is ready to do hands-on or in a position to do hands-on work in the field. With our cat work, there's tons of things that people could do in a remote setting, perhaps maintaining our social media, scheduling clinics, reminder calls to the TNR trappers so that they remember, you know, don't feed the cats before, all of the, the rules and, and, you know, reminders for the road data entry, providing support for you and the community, all kinds of things. And thinking outside the box, I don't know if you guys saw this, in the last, a couple of months ago, it was recent, um, this hit all the social media. This meant gentleman Larry, or sorry, Terry Lorman, he, he got so much attention by volunteering for this uh, safe haven pet sanctuary in Wisconsin because he, he started to volunteer for them. And they found that as he was doing socialization, he does grooming and things for the cats in this shelter. He kept falling asleep on the, on the couch <laughs> and it ended up going viral. And the organization raised $30,000 because there's all these pictures of Terry sleeping with the cats covering him. And it was just so cute and great and such a a simple way to show the power of volunteer work. I loved this. Lazy volunteer, but in a very good way. So my takeaway when it comes to recruitment is that you really need a volunteer for every job you need filled, but you don't need to find a job for every person who wants to volunteer. It's okay to have some limits around what you need because the worst thing is to be overrun with a lot of people who want to be helpful and have them feel like there's 30 other people doing their job, that they're not able to, to contribute in a meaningful way, and for you to be overwhelmed. So it's you are welcome to say, you know what, we are filled in that role. We would welcome you to put yourself on a wait list, but right now that's not the assistance we need, and direct people to other roles. You are in control here, and you need what you need. So as part of recruitment, I would encourage you to do orientations. Hopefully many of you are doing this, but if you aren't, I think it's a valuable way to do a first screen and help screen people out even who might not be a right fit. And by orientation, I mean providing an overview of what the organization does, providing clarity around what you're seeking in the volunteer roles, telling them what positions are currently available, letting them know what positions are filled, if you have a shelter or facility, offering them a tour so they can see where they'd be working, explaining some of the policies around why you do what you do, and even talking about the challenges and benefits of being a volunteer. So that people have an expectation or understanding to say, hmm, is this the right fit for me? And you know what? At the end of that orientation, if some volunteers say, great, loved hearing about it, I don't think this is the place for me. That is okay. And in fact, it will save you time in the long run because it, it, otherwise, what if you hadn't done this? You brought a volunteer on, you took time showing them the road, and, and then you discover it's not the right fit or they're not happy. You have wasted significant amount of energy and time in a person who isn't the right fit for the organization. So orientations take time, but are a great screening tool. 
And also, and this is a really hard one, is to consider actually interviewing volunteers. And I know, again, time is, is short and it can be challenging, but if you take the time to have a conversation with a volunteer, uh, again, it can save you time in the long run. With volunteer engagement, everything is an upfront investment. But once you get things up and running and you have strong volunteers in place, they can help you with these processes and help you onboard other volunteers so that the burden is shared and you guys are rocking and rolling with a lot of really great supporters. So. Additionally, the benefit of interviewing people when they're volunteering, wanting to volunteer for you is being able to learn about each other and you learn about them. If you ask some good questions of these prospective volunteers, you might be surprised at what you find. Uh, sometimes somebody may com be coming in because they want to have hands-on experience with cats, for example, but you also discover that by their day job, they're a PR executive or you know whatever the skill set may be. And while they may not want to do that role for you as a volunteer because this is their volunteer work, they want to do something fun and different, if you know the skills they have, you might be able to tap into those skills when you need them. And as a volunteer, they may be more than happy to provide their expertise. Additionally, if you don't interview and screen volunteers, what happens? The volunteers you've invested time in decide it's not right, they disappear. Also, they get frustrated because their expectations weren't met, so it doesn't look great for you in the community. Or even worse, sometimes volunteers may take it upon themselves to try and change your organization to be what they want versus what you want. How many of you had that experience? <laughs> so I really encourage you not to skip this step. And again, ensuring the right fit, that not everyone is suited for this work, whether it's TNR or working in an animal shelter, that it is okay to, to say, you know what, I don't think this is gonna make you a happy person to be here. It seems like, for example, um, sometimes people find it really emotional to work in an animal shelter or to do trapping. And, and perhaps that's not a right role for them. And it's okay to find them a different role or even refer them to another organization that might be a better suit for them. And allowing a volunteer who isn't right can have some consequences and also end up causing you a lot more time and energy in the long run. So, so be careful about ensuring there is a good fit. And my last kind of comment on this is recognizing that, especially in most of the work that we do, if we're hearing, and I know all of us on this probably have said this at one time or another, I do see it as a red flag when we say, I actually like animals better than I like people. And there's nothing wrong with that per se, but it's important to think about what is the organization doing? What are the roles require? And what skills do people need? If it's someone who truly just has no tolerance or patience for the community and for working with people, and they just wanna sit in the back room with cats, you need to be very careful about where you're placing them because almost every position, or at least not every, but a lot of positions require interacting with the public. And you can really undermine the organization and the effectiveness of your, of your goals by including folks who can't communicate with the public. And again, if we're gonna solve these issues and ensure that cats are safe in our communities, we have to be able to engage the community and help to educate them, help them to do the right things. And as a result, we have to be friendly to other human beings. Okay, so moving right along. Gosh, there's a lot of content here. So five, providing training. Uh, again, critically important, and I want to share my own true story here. Uh, I, when I started at that animal shelter in Texas, they were completely the revolving door. It was, uh, I was kind of thrown into the work. Uh, I, I saw a little slideshow, that was it, about the organization, at least they had that. And then when I started working, no one really knew what to do with me. And so when I would go in for my shift, which I sort of decided on my own because they didn't really have shifts, um, you know, I'd say to them, what can I do to help? And they would just sort of say, well, you know, you can wash some dishes or this needs being done. And one day they said to me, um, hey, you know, the cat cages in the isolation room need cleaning. Can you do that? And I thought, OK, sure. Now I will share with you, I am. I am a, a self-proclaimed crazy cat lady now, but at that time of my life, I had never had a cat and I had never really been around cats. Um, I'm so glad that changed for me because my life is better for it. But I grew up as a true blue dog person. So 
they sent this true blue dog person into what I didn't realize at the time was the feral cat holding room. <laughs> and I started cleaning cages. And what we quickly discovered was that cats were fleeing the cages and hiding up on top of shelves and underneath cage banks. And it was not a pretty sight. And I had no idea what I was doing wrong. And the animal control actually teased me about it. So uh, had I known, nobody bothered to tell me that these were feral cats. Nobody showed me how the slider works to isolate a feral cat to one side so that I can safely clean without either myself getting injured or the cat escaping. And so that is a perfect to me story that illustrates why training is so important because I was so well intentioned. I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to help them. And I actually created a lot more work for them. And, uh, and it, it made me feel bad because obviously I was there to help and I wasn't helping at all. And so uh, I encourage you to take the time to train the volunteers that you are bothering to engage in your programs. And again, as an objective tool, I would encourage you to write your policies and procedures down. Um, uh, let them be accessible to folks. Help them to understand why you do what you do. For example, around these issues, I would have some information on like, do you spay pregnant cats? Just as an example. And if you do, why? Or if you don't, why? At what point? would that be done? Um, you know, what is the appropriate monitoring of cat traps? You know, how long are they allowed to be out? What about ear tipping? Is every cat in the program ear tipped? When might not cats be ear tipped, if at all? Um, do you relocate cats? You know, how do you make medical care decisions? These are important things. And as a group, specifically, if it's an all volunteer organization, you know, the rules can tend to shift and change and be made up by who's available on what day. And it's important to have consistency to ensure that you are making good decisions, that everybody is playing by the same rule book so that you aren't running into challenges. So I'd encourage you to take a little time, put those things in writing and make it accessible. Um, I love when organizations have a special page or a special login section, for example, of their website, or even a, just a simple Google doc or a Google drive where volunteers always have a link and they know they can go and look something up can be hugely important and save you a lot of headaches. And I would also, in addition to training volunteers broadly, they need to be trained in their very specific job. You know, what is it you're asking them to do and are you handholding them through the process? And training involves demonstrating, showing them, and th this is a great example in this picture of even showing people how to set a cat trap. I mean, it, for those of us who do this work every day, it seems like a no brainer, but volunteers who are new don't know how to do these things. So we have to demonstrate, we have to allow ability for them to ask questions and to participate frequently because again, volunteers aren't there every single day. They may only come in once a month or once in a while and they need to have backup in case they forget. They may need some reminders and having checklists are so helpful. Um, you know, for, for each of the roles that you're asking volunteers to do, can you put a laminated sheet and make it accessible for them so they, they quickly know, here are the steps to setting up a cat trap. Um, you know, even simple stuff like how many, how much food does a cat get and doing a little tip sheet on how to feed cats so that we're not making them sick or we know when to provide, when to provide it. Simple stuff so that you have consistency, volunteers feel empowered and that they are doing it right. And this also goes with our volunteers being properly equipped. If you're asking a volunteer to go out and trap, do they have all of the tools they need to do it well? Um, do they have the newspaper they need to line the traps? Is there a first aid kit in case someone scratches themselves on the metal? You know, are they, do they have the tra uh, the tarp so that, you know, they're putting that underneath the cats for transport? Whatever it is, making sure that those tools are available and accessible to them, or at least a list of what they should bring themselves is available, goes a long way to empowering volunteers to do it right. Um, it's amazing to me how often, you know, and how frustrating it can be for volunteers, even for example, just using dog walking in a shelter as a perfect example. I've seen so many scenarios where, you know, shelters request dog walkers, but then when they come in to do their shift, they're trying to find leashes, you know, because the leashes, of course, they always disappear, right? And they don't know where the poop bags are. And then they don't know they have to mark off when the dog's been walked. It's really important for volunteers to feel empowered and equipped in those ways. And lastly, on this, just a touching base about reducing risk. Um, you know, 
the training that you provide, having these things in writing are all important also in protecting your organization. The more volunteers are trained, they understand the rules of the road, the less likely they are to be injured or to do something that accidentally causes either someone else to be injure, injured or, you know, God forbid, a cat be injured, right? So it's all important in terms of um, making this as safe for everyone involved as possible. All right, let's move into now. How do we build some leadership amongst our volunteer core? All of you on here, I'm imagining are wonderful volunteer leaders because you're here and you're learning and you're growing and I bet you take on a lot in all of your organizations. So I think about this, are volunteers able to grow in your program? Can you offer some advancing levels of responsibility? And, you know, maybe having a volunteer present at a meeting on your behalf or developing volunteers into leaders of other volunteers, but also recognizing that not every person who volunteers for you is going to want to grow. Some may just want to come in and do that one thing, do it well, and that's their zen. And that's quite all right. But a lot of volunteers over time do like opportunities to advance in the organization. And so you can handpick some volunteer leaders. Who are those volunteers that you and everyone else knows they can count on? Is that person someone who would like to take on a bigger role perhaps? Um, you know, letting them get more deeply engaged. Again, making it official, creating a job position for them that is a more advanced role that outlines their roles or responsibilities. Um, it can be great. Discuss what they'll have an opportunity to do. How can we entice volunteers to take on more of a leadership role? And, you know, what might be some negatives? What are some things they might have to give up in order to help the organization in a bigger way? Like maybe someone really does love the hands on with cats every day, but they would make a great person at training other volunteers. So how can we help them to do that additional work that will provide bigger support to the organization and still let, let them get their warm and fuzzy, the piece that they really enjoy? There's a balance here to all of this, right? And if we're going to share leadership with other volunteers, we need to let them do their work and help others to feel comfortable in, in taking direction from other volunteers. Also, I think even if a volunteer may not want to take on a bigger role, there are things we can do to offer some variety and fun in the work that we're offering volunteers to do. And this is just an example. I put this on the screen because, um, you know, you see here it's someone doing a pet of the week spot on a local television station. And I had the opportunity to do that when I was a volunteer at the Brazos Animal Shelter. I'd been with them, say, about six months. And, you know, they were trying to figure out their holiday schedule and they needed someone to cover on the local news station with the pet of the week. And they asked me because at that point, you know, I had been there consistently. They knew me well enough that they thought, OK, she won't mess this up too badly. And they gave me a chance to go on TV. Of course, I was terrified, but I did it. And it was such a great honor. And as, as you can imagine, as a volunteer being asked to do something like that, shows me that the organization had trust in me, that I was valuable part of their team, and I supported them. They were able to go on holiday without worrying about who was taking care of Pet of the Week. So it can be a great way to keep volunteers engaged, reduce burnout, and get more done, frankly. And so another option is having volunteers step into the role of screening and supporting other volunteers. Um, you know, can we set up mentoring systems? Can volunteers provide the training and how to do work with new volunteers? It can be a great way to spread out the workload. But also, don't be reluctant to simply ask anyone to help you with a leadership task. That, you know, people are more than happy to step in and help. Not everything has to be super structured. That, you know, they may find they enjoyed whatever it was you asked them to do on a moment's notice. So, you know, I'm a big believer in asking for the help you need and hope you'll get it. Because I think people are very willing to provide support if they know you need it. Lastly, I want you to think about offering continuing learning opportunities. I mean, this online cat conference is a perfect example. Can we invite our volunteers to trainings that we're offering to staff if we're an organization with paid staff? If we're an all volunteer group, can we still bring in an outside speaker or have training sessions we provide for one another? And maybe even getting together with the other organizations in our community 
and train together. So even as an all cat rescue, are there other cat rescues, dog rescues, animal shelters, even non-animal organizations that might be able to provide customer service training or whatever it may be? There's a lot of opportunity. So I would encourage you to have training as an ongoing piece of your volunteer engagement. And lastly, we're going to talk about giving feedback, and then I'm going to open the floor for questions and help you solve any of your most pressing needs related to volunteer engagement. So when it comes to providing recognition for volunteers, obviously saying thank you is really important. You guys all talked about earlier, volunteers need to feel appreciated. They want to be thanked, but I don't feel like thank you is enough. Thank you is important, but you need to catch, in a way, catch them doing the right thing. And the, and, the, and the appreciation should be specific to that individual. So for example, uh, you overhear a volunteer on the phone with a member of the public who's asking about, you know, what is trap neuter turn or when is the next spay neuter clinic? Or maybe it's a, a challenging phone call and someone's upset that there are cats in their neighborhood or whatever it may be. And you hear that volunteer handle them beautifully make sure you go up to them after that call and say, hey, you know, Kim, I heard you on the phone with that person. It sounded like that was a really challenging conversation. I just want to tell you how well I thought you handled it. You were really calm. You made the person feel understood and heard. And it sounded like the call resolved in a really wonderful way. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. We couldn't do this without you. Now, that is a very different thank you from simply when they're walking out the door of the night going, hey, thanks. We'll see you tomorrow. Right. So catching someone and providing specific feedback about their performance is super important. Also sharing any testimonials or thank yous you're getting from people who take advantage of your services. Make sure volunteers get to hear what people in the community are saying about their appreciation for the organization. And never hurts to hand write a note or make a phone call to a volunteer to thank them as well. part of recognition, but share problems and challenges. You want to feel like they're making a difference. So if you share, okay, here's some, we're having some financial difficulties. Here's some of the things we're going to try to do to correct it. Volunteers will feel more trusted. They'll feel part of the team. They're going to, they're going to sense that there are things going on in the organization. So the more you can include them in helping to even solve problems, is a great way to help them feel retained, engaged, and motivated in helping you. At the end of the day, the real magic to keeping volunteers comes from those things you do on a daily basis to make And part of that involves checking in with them regularly. Um, What do they love the most? And what have they found to be the most frustrating? A question I love to ask, what did you not expect that you have found in this volunteer role? It's amazing what you can learn by just talking to volunteers. Or suddenly stops coming in, give them a call. Maybe something is happening that you have going on and you could actually remedy it simply by knowing it's an issue contacting them and asking them you know is there some a reason you stop volunteering sometimes it might just be something in their life and they just need to take a break or maybe they need a different position you won't know unless you ask and so knowing why they leave helping them feel appreciated and heard it helps you to make adjustments along the way and I want to address lastly here, some uh, provide some guidance around what to happen when things aren't going beautifully. So first is, do you have a clear process for addressing issues with volunteers? Do they know who to talk to if they're upset about something? And do you know who's going to intervene if there's a problem with a volunteer? Knowing and having that thought through up in advance is really important. And I love to think about this too, because you know when volunteers are causing an issue or there's you know a volunteer is whatever the issue may be, they're they're not performing well or they're creating a problem with other volunteers. It's important to take the time to sit down and talk to them and understand what's going on because sometimes it may be something we're doing that we're not even aware of. 
And do we have a good process for volunteers to know how to raise their concerns? Uh, we do, we rather volunteers not go on our social media channels and start blasting the organization, right? I mean, how many of us have seen that happen? Rather, do they know there is someone they can go to and have a conversation in hopes that actually something can be done about it? Um, I do like the idea of having codes of conduct, and this could be built into a volunteer position description or some sort of an agreement that just talks about and lays out how we're going to work together and that when there's an issue, here's the course of action we're all going to take so that we have some, again, rules of the road we're all going to abide by. And it's important that when something goes wrong, we don't just stick our heads in the sand. Um, these are a couple of examples. Uh, for example, Jane is a great trapper, and those are so hard to find, but she's rude to the staff at the clinic we're using, and she's jeopardizing our relationship with them. You know, because Jane's this great trapper, it can be tempting as an organization to ignore the fact that she's being rude to staff at the clinic and kind of just tolerate Jane because of that, and we need the trappers. But at the end of the day, what's actually happening? What's happening to the people at the clinic? Is she undermining this relationship with the vet clinic that's critical to your program? I would say potentially yes. So we can't just tolerate things from volunteers that aren't appropriate because we're either afraid of losing them or we're uncomfortable with conflict because the stakes are high and their bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. And so it's really important for everyone in, in your program and for your program's goals, not to let poor performance go unaddressed. Um, that, you know, recognizing that when something is going wrong, it's a great opportunity to provide training, find out if there's something you can address, but don't allow it to continue. And how do we do this? I'm often asked, how in the world do I address issues with volunteers? And there's really four simple steps. One is discuss it in private and it has to be face to face. Don't send off some passive aggressive email telling a volunteer they're doing something wrong. <laughs> it's the easy way out, but it's not the effective way out. Sit down with them, have a conversation and be, uh, you know, be compassionate, but also state what you're observing. So, you know, sit down and say, you know, Jim, here's what I'm seeing. Here's the impact it's having on our program. And I'd like to hear from you what's going on and what we can do to solve this. And then listen to what Jim has to say. Maybe there's something unexpected. Maybe he's just having a bad day, whatever it is. Problem solved together. Okay, how are we going to resolve this? Let's agree on the next steps, agree on a timeline, and then make sure you follow up. So at the end of that conversation with Jim, you've decided together, here's the next steps, um, and then say, okay, I'm going to check back in with you in a few weeks, three weeks, and see how things are going, and actually do it. Sit back down with Jim in three weeks. How did it go? Is the, is the issue resolved, or do we need to take additional steps? So that's how you address it. And it's important to avoid defensiveness, even when you're stressed out, try to be as calm and objective, recognizing that sometimes a volunteer actually might be right. Maybe they're acting out or they're doing something because they see a problem and they're unsure of how to, how to fix it, or they're concerned about safety or, or whatever it may be. Uh, and you won't know that unless you sit down and talk with them. Also recognizing that maybe it's not, the issue that's going on may not really be a problem per se, perhaps it's a poor fit. So maybe someone's just in the wrong position and perhaps having the conversation and assigning them to a different role can change things. So if they stay on after this kind of an intervention, just be sure you're documenting uh, and, and then move on. You know, we don't need to have drama continue in our lives. And if they go, maybe they decide, you know, this isn't working for me. Again, document it, uh, you know, issue some sort of email or exit letter thanking them for their service and you know, let folks know that this person's no longer involved. And I think if all else fails at the end of the day, when someone isn't right for your program, it is okay to let them go. It's really hard to do, but it's important. And you, you, know, you can't under allow one kind of bad apple to spoil the whole bunch or a volunteer to undermine your bigger picture efforts. And so all of tools I've provided you in this webinar so far, you can hopefully now see how each of those tools can be super beneficial when you have to let a volunteer go. If you don't have a written job description, if you haven't provided any training, and then suddenly Alice is doing something wrong, how in the world do you have that conversation with Alice? 
How do you say you're not doing it right? You've never told her what doing it right means. She's never been clear on what the expectations are and what this, what she should be doing. So when you have these pieces in place, it makes it so much easier to come back and say, hey, we provided the training. Here's what was in the job description. Here's why this isn't working out. And then you can um, move on from there. At the end of the day, I really believe folks are kind of on your bus or they're off the bus and that if it's not working, it's better to let a volunteer go than to allow it to continue. And so at the end of the day, your volunteers are going to stick with you if they see that the work they're doing is meaningful and is accomplishing something. If they're feeling recognized and appreciated for the time that they're donating to you, and if they're enjoying working with you and the other people in the organization and the cause that you're, that you're dedicated to, that's what's going to keep them involved. And not one size fits all. Obviously, volunteers like each of us are coming with different motivations and needs, and it's up to us to pay attention to how it's going with each person and help keep them engaged. And lastly, I love this uh, image. I think I use this in pretty much every presentation I give in that, you know, we think it's such a straight line from here to there and getting there. And I made all of this sound so easy by giving you tips and tools. But at the end of the day, people are messy. These issues are messy. They're emotional. They're challenging. And so don't beat yourself up if it's a struggle, because I think the struggle is part of the journey and the process. So that is a lot of content. And um, uh, I welcome your questions. It looks like we have about 12 minutes, I think, if my clock is correct. So lay it on me. What can I do to help you guys? <laughs> wow. All I can say is, wow, what an incredible uh, job. That's uh, a ton of information. Um, and I have been kind of scanning the uh, question box. There have been a few questions that have come up um, while you're chatting. Um, and a couple questions about um, online volunteer software and hmm. utilizing volunteers for self-scheduling. Okay. Uh, I guess what's the question in there? Um, there uh, just are. wondering, is, is it valuable? I mean, is that something oh. that, that organizations should look into? Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, it, especially the bigger your program is, the more helpful an online type system can be. And there are a number of them out there. Uh, Vlogistics is one. Um, Better Impact is another. I hear good things about both. I've seen a lot of shelters switching over to Better Impact lately, so um, I would check them out. I think they're an Australian-based company, but there is a lot of benefit to using those systems because they're pretty robust, and within them, you can populate them with different volunteer jobs and different schedules, and then all of them offer a portal or a login for volunteers. So they have a so on the back end, as a volunteer coordinator, you can kind of run everything. And then as a volunteer, they can come in and see cer only certain things. So if there are, for example, a uh, foster volunteer, they would only see things that perhaps pertain to their schedule as a foster, but it does allow them to choose schedule times that you have indicated. They can find a replacement for themselves if they're unable to attend a shift, things like that, that just help to automate what you would normally have to do by a bunch of emails or texts or phone calls. So I definitely would encourage you to look into it, though I think most, if not all, I don't know of free ones. Uh, maybe you guys do. And if you do, feel free to share them in the question box um, because I know others would love to know about it. So the, you know, the, there may be a cost, but it could very well be worth the effort. Um, if you're small or you're just getting started, most of this you could even handle with some Google documents and some spreadsheets, you know, so you don't have to necessarily overthink it, but absolutely the onward, online software tools can be a great benefit. Um, this is an interesting question about there's several coordinators in the organization and a couple of them have left due to some concerns about the executive director doing micromanagement. Mm. And so there's some questions about how to approach the executive director to help facilitate giving the coordinators more responsibility, but yet ensuring that the job is being done the way it should be done. That's a great question and really is comes down to managing up, right? And a lot of folks struggle with that. Um, you know, as we can advocate strongly for our volunteers, but it's always hard to advocate for yourself. <laughs> um, and so I would 
I would approach that if I were a volunteer coordinator in that situation, I would think carefully around what it is I'm trying to achieve. And if I'm going to approach the executive director, which I think is a great idea, I would do it in a non-threatening way, but more in a way of here's what we're seeing happening. And I would like your help and like to talk to you about what can we do, right? So it's um, maybe helping the executive director to understand and, and together come up with what, what are the goals we're trying to achieve through the volunteer engagement and what's getting in the way of that and what can we do to eliminate those barriers? And so doing it in a way that's not going there and obviously wagging a finger or saying, you're doing X, Y, Z, but maybe talking about what would be possible in the program if we gave volunteers some more autonomy or power or whatever that looks like. Um, and if the executive director would be supportive of that. I don't know if I'm explaining that well, but I think it's a careful conversation. Um, it can be tricky because at the end of the day, your executive director is the head of the organization and some are fabulous and some aren't. So, um, you know, hopefully uh, a good leader would be open to feedback when it's presented in a way that they could hear it. Um, and also, you know, it doesn't hurt to have volunteers provide feedback. So another idea, actually, and maybe this is a, even a better suggestion, is what about surveying volunteers and staff about volunteer engagement or surveying them about what they like about their roles and what they found challenging in their roles? Um, there is a tool, there are a couple of tools out there to help you do that, because if you survey, then you're presenting objectively impact input you're receiving from the entire organization and it's harder for an executive director to ignore that right there's um there's a, a book and it's called the oh gosh i think it's the volunteer program audit through energize if you go to energize inc inc.com and you look in their bookstore it's a downloadable pdf and it's just a it's an audit so you can you and others in the program can conduct an audit of how things are going with volunteers you could present that to the executive director present the findings or um university of north carolina at charlotte has created a volunteer program assessment tool which i helped them create probably 15 years ago now. It is free, though they do have a pretty long waiting list because it's so popular. Um, it was designed for animal shelters, actually, but other kinds of nonprofits are now using it. And it's strictly uh, an online survey of your volunteers. And it rates everything from communication to you know um, commitment to the organization, to leadership, to all of these different things that we're talking about. And, and it gives you uh, a report about how that's going. And it compares you to uh, kind of the norms nationally from other organizations. So you can see how, how are we doing compared to others. A tool like that is a fabulous thing to bring to an executive director to have a conversation and to look at what could be done differently. Because again, you're crowdsourcing feedback. It's not just you delivering frustration to an executive, but you're saying, here's what we've learned and here are some things we could do to improve it. So I feel like one topic that we have to address that really hasn't been brought up today is board members as volunteers in two components. One is getting board members on the board, which is a volunteer position. And then the other question is board members acting as volunteers within the organization or day-to-day -day operations. And what are your thoughts in that area? Mm, yeah, great question. Um, well, for one, I, so to start with the first question, I would say in terms of recruiting board members, I mean, and, and it's a, a very relevant question because board members are volunteers, right? I mean, they're very, they're high level executive volunteers in this situation in that particular role, if they're going to be on your governing board, but they are volunteering their time to do it. So just as you would any volunteer position, I think creating your board role is really important. And, you know, there are matrices out there. Um, I, I could probably share one. I'll see if I can find one for you. But um, maybe make a list of what skills you need on your board and what skills are currently filled by current board members and what's missing. So maybe you you have some amazing board members, but you are missing some skills around finances. Then what I would encourage you to do is go out and recruit a board member specifically who has a background in finance, right? It's it's going out and seeking what the skill set is you need and making sure that your board is well-rounded, is appropriate and ready to help govern the organization. Um, uh, and the second part 
was around board members as hands-on volunteers. So in that scenario, and I see this a lot in all kinds of organizations, board members do often want to get their hands dirty, right? They want to experience what the organization is all about. That can be good and it can be challenging. So I, I think it's wonderful if board members want to experience the organization, but I think we also have to be careful of what hat they're wearing and when. And I think if we're allowing board members to be, say, a volunteer and take on an, a volunteer role, let's just be clear about which hat they're wearing at that moment. And that if they're going to be, for example, um, in there doing you know, cat socialization in the shelter, that at that moment in time, they have to take off that board member hat and they are wearing a volunteer hat. And for some organizations that can be a little messy. So I feel like in that situation, you do need some guidance and support from the executive director or the you know, CEO, president, whoever it is, to be a good liaison and help to, um, and, and to help ensure that the board members aren't overstepping, they aren't giving direction to staff, you know, that kind of thing, because it can be a little tricky. So I would think just being very clear about the role and what hat they're wearing when. That's great. And um, I think with, this will be our last question. Uh, can you give more examples of how to show appreciation? Oh, sure. Um, oh, gosh, there's so many different ways. I mean, a lot of organizations will do like an annual uh, picnic or a dinner or something so that everyone can come together and just celebrate the good work of the organization. I love that. I mean, it's super simple. I mean, it's not simple because it takes work to coordinate it, um, but it can be a great way to build camaraderie. I think when you do that, if you do have paid staff, I would try to do joint recognition whenever possible. So because I often see in organizations some a little bit of division and not necessarily in a negative way, but that, that staff and volunteers you know, don't always come together as a team in the way we would like to see them do so. So for, for example, if we're gonna do a recognition event, can staff, you know, recognize volunteers and can volunteers recognize staff? And what can we do to acknowledge the work that was achieved together? Because, you know, at the end of the day, none of this would have happened without these folks involved. And I think being specific and sharing the actual impact that volunteers have made is probably one of the best recognition options available. And by that, I don't simply mean saying volunteers contributed 400 hours this year, right? I feel like everyone does that. It's not a bad thing to do to say, this is how many hours people contributed and here's what that would mean in budget dollars. But at the end of the day, people could donate 400 hours and not actually get anything done. So in terms of recognition, I think making sure volunteers know what was accomplished because of them and because they were there. I think that is incredibly powerful. So in addition for individual volunteers, what about writing them a handwritten card and mailing it to their house or, you know, and, and letting them know what you've seen them do and the impact that they personally made. Um, you know, I, I've seen organizations do other things like when volunteers reach certain milestones in their work, they upgrade to a, a special badge or, you know, a special, you know, shirt or whatever it is to kind of just to, to help acknowledge that effort. But really, at the end of the day, showing the impact of the volunteers is the most important thing and the most uh, critical way to keep them motivated. That's great. Excellent. Uh, looks like we have, we're at about 1130 and it looks like we've got pretty much everybody. I think everybody is incredibly blown away by all that incredible content, Betsy. There's just a Wonderful. lot of food for thought here. So I appreciate this. It was a, a fantastic presentation. I uh, just want to make sure everybody sees her contact information here on this last slide. Um, any parting thoughts before we uh, shut down for our break? I'll just say thank you so much for having me. It was truly an honor. I am so grateful to all the work you guys do out there and go cats. <laughs> <laughs>